I wasn't always a believer in athletic testing. But after taking the time to learn about it, monitor its usage and recognize the successful practices since 2015, I will forever use it in evaluations. I'll organize this feature in that manner, start with the simplest forms of athletic testing usage, then go into a deeper dive. If you watched the NFL Combine on television, you were inundated with singular testing results. Montez Sweat ran a 4.41. Emmanuel Hall jumped 11 feet 9 inches. Garrett Bradbury posted 34 bench press reps. Those singular numbers can be cool and have some shock factor, but on their own often don't tell us much as a player. Instead, it is better to recognize that a profile is made up of 7 or 8 athletic tests. With the knowledge that every test should be factored into a profile, the next step is understanding the importance of weight. Terry Godwin, Georgia, who I really like as a third-day slot option, ran a 4.5540 at 184 pounds. Nikhil Harry, Arizona State, who also worked out of the slot and created many of his big plays from that alignment, ran a 4.5340 at 228 pounds. The 0.02 difference in the times isn't the significant figure, it is the weight difference of 44 pounds. Although the raw results are similar, wouldn't you say the weight disparity plays a major part on a football field, in terms of force and power? So incorporating every test plus factoring in weight results in a full athletic profile, otherwise known as a composite score. The best place to find composite scores is 3sigmothlete.com. All scores cited below come from Zach Whitman's site. That composite score allows you to compare prospects across decades since they participate in the same tests, hence why the NFL Combine should not be modernized, as eliminating events ruins the sample and comparables. The simplest way teams should use athletic testing is to eliminate non-NFL caliber athletes. Eliminate the players that are two sigmas, standard deviations away from the mean, from draft boards. There are so few prospects who succeed after testing in that area. For teams, that instantly eliminates hundreds of players from a 1,700 prospect pool. I can tell you that athletic testing led me to love Grady Jarrett, Nick Easton, Justin Coleman, Joe Thune and Shaq Mason, Justin Simmons, Chris Godwin, Jannard Avery, Fred Warner, and it should have led me to many more, like Daniil Hunter, Jordan Hicks, David Onyemata, Michael Pierce, Matt Breida and others. With that knowledge, let's move to each position and outline important takeaways for each spot. Quarterback The focus is so singled in on Kyler Murray that little attention is being paid to Dwayne Haskins. And even less attention is being paid to any quarterback in the second tier or after. We do spend too much time focusing on non-first-round quarterbacks as possible starters, and certainly not quality starters. In the last 10 drafts, the list is Russell Wilson, Dak Prescott and Kirk Cousins. Maybe Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, Andy Dalton. It is difficult to not buy into Kyler Murray at no. One to the Cardinals. So many reports are pointing in that direction. I'll just warn you and say this is super early in the draft process. We did not know Baker Mayfield would be the no. One overall pick until the week of the draft. Now, if Josh Rosen is traded, we know Murray will be first. But consider this, it isn't just a Rosen for Murray scenario. In reality, it is Rosen and Nick Bosa, or whatever number one pick you want, for Murray and a second or third round pick received in a trade for Rosen. Still, this is a team that dumped a head coach after one season for an offensive mind, going all the way in on that offensive coach's style is not a crazy thought. Running back with Josh Jacobs not participating due to injury, the focus turned to David Montgomery, Devin Singletary, Elijah Holyfield and whoever your personal favorites are. Holyfield tested like the worst athlete at the position, in the 4th percentile. That's still in the range of successful backs like Dalvin Cook and James Conner, 6th percentile. Montgomery and Singletary posted scores near the 20th percentile. That's not good, nor is it average, but it is fine. 
there have been successful ball carriers with the same profile, and they could always improve. Yes, they did not meet your expectations, but expectations are self-created. On the other end, Justice Hill out of Oklahoma State posted a 94th percentile composite score, the top of the group. His size, 198 pounds, and style likely projects him as a secondary back who can succeed in space and the passing game. Those are super important now, especially ones who can also create like him. One way to use athletic testing is for it to confirm early round graded prospects, and then to point in the direction of possible late round developmental players. Alex Barnes might be a third day back worth targeting. He creates so much force with his combination of size and explosion. Daniel Losco was the name that came to mind. Wide receiver this is an amazing receiver class. The athletes at the top push it there, with seven receivers weighing over 200 pounds and testing over the 90th percentile, including four at 214 pounds or more. The NFL went through a period where big receivers were king. It will always be a position where creating separation and winning after the catch is vital, but hear me out, what if those receivers are also over 6 foot 2? DK Metcalf stole the attention as he should, but with his horrific testing in the shuttle and three cone, it is fair to wonder if that will hold him back. If it does, he could draw comparisons to Stephen Hill, Sammy Coates. I'm betting on Metcalf. Andy Isabella profiles like a slot receiver at 5 foot 9 and 188 pounds, but his game might be closer to Tyler Lockett if he lines up on the outside. The question is if a team will allow him to break that inside mold and play against bigger corners. Hakeem Butler is my top receiver. He wins big, he even wins small which is crazy for a 6 foot 5, 227 pounds target. Don't focus on the drops, that's a handful, or two, plays on the entire season. Emmanuel Hall and Miles Boykin, two players with 99th percentile athletic profiles for ones to watch more. Over 20 yards per catch for Hall on his career, and over 15 for Boykin. Offensive line prior to the combine, I showed you the success rate of OL who hit the impressive 4.47 20-yard shuttle time. These are the top combine testers from 2010 to 2018. In that span, over 300 OL prospects have completed a 20-yard shuttle. The top 22 are listed above. As you can see, 19 of the 22 were drafted, and those drafted players went on to start 85% of their career games. Taking it one step further, the 8th A3 OL have started 85.47% of their career games. Let us all welcome Washington State's Andre Dillard to the club. He was the only one who hit the mark this year. Dillard is already considered a first-rounder, so this should make all evaluators feel even more comfortable. Isn't that one purpose of using athletic testing? The late-rounder I want to look at is SUAO Pate out of Weaver State. Edge there are levels to edge rushers. At this point in the calendar, we know some names who are first-rounders. So when they double that confidence with outstanding athletic profiles, like Rashawn Gary, Montez Sweat and Brian Burns, it promotes comfort in evaluations. Then there are great athletes who are currently slotted outside of the first round, therefore, it is difficult to gauge where their draft slot will be. Ben Banoku out of TCU and Max Crosby from Eastern Michigan stand out, and teams with cohesive evaluators and coaching staffs, like the Vikings, do well with those types of prospects. If you would like to avoid the negative nuggets, overlook this graph. Again, one way to use athletic testing is to avoid non-NFL caliber athletes. Right now, and this can change with pro day improvements, George's Jonathan Ledbetter and Florida's CC Jefferson qualify for that label. Linebacker, since I started with this year's group there have been two names at the top, Devin Bush and Devin White. It's awesome to see them as the top two athletes at the position. Athletic profiles might generate depth at this position, which might have been lacking before. Defensive back it's so fitting that the talent of the receiver class is matched by the athletic talent at corner. 
For a fun exercise, let's put ourselves in the Seahawks scouting department. The last seven outside corners the Seahawks drafted have 32-inch arms or longer. At the NFL Combine, 16 of the 36 corners fit that arm length threshold. Meaning Seattle theoretically shortens their pool of players in the hopes of improving evaluations thanks to the narrowed list. Five of those corners produced composite scores in the 90th percentile or higher. Amazing. Again, all athletic testing can be improved at pro days. The instant reaction is to dismiss pro day results. Why? There are 1,700 prospects in each class. How are we supposed to compare these testing results to those not at the NFL Combine, if we aren't allowing these participants to improve their profiles on the same playing field?